Church, welcome to week two of the Songs of Christmas. Thank you to everyone who took stars and bought gifts for the kids in our community. Tonight, right here at Bullard, we'll be getting together to wrap all those gifts. So join us at 5 p.m. There will be Christmas music, pizza, and gift wrapping. It's going to be a blast. See you there. Next Sunday, December 10th, is Christmas Sweater Sunday. So wear your cute or ugly Christmas sweater. We can't wait to see them. Sunday, December 17th is our PC Kids Christmas program. Your kids have been working so hard on this. It's gonna be amazing. So get here early to get the best seats in the house for the cutest Christmas performance you've ever seen. Just a reminder, we'll be right here live at 10 a.m. on both Christmas and New Year's Eve. And as usual, we'll have the online services available for both of those Sundays. If you'd like to give to Prodigal Church, head to our app or website, or use the kiosk and boxes in the lobby. And to stay up to date with all that's happening, make sure you download the Particle Church app on your phone. Another way to keep up with the calendar is to follow us on Instagram, at Particle Church Fresno. Thanks for joining us today for week two of Songs of Christmas. Merry Christmas! Joy to the World was not written as a Christmas carol. In its original form, it actually had nothing to do with Christmas at all. It wasn't even a song. Isaac Watts, one of the great hymn writers in church history, wrote one of the most famous hymns by accident. In 1719, Watts published a book of poems in which each poem was based on a psalm from scripture. One of those poems was an adaptation of Psalm 98. 
Watts interprets this psalm as a celebration of Jesus' role as king of both his church and the whole world. More than a century later, the second half of this poem was slightly adapted and then set to music to give us what has now become one of the most famous Christmas carols of all. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Now let's read Psalm 98 together and hear the inspiration for the song. Psalm 98, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Can you see the inspiration for joy to the world? So the song was a scripture before it was a poem, and it was a poem before it was a song. It was set to music in 1848 by American composer Lowell Mason. And the structure of the song is just so memorable, right? Those first two stanzas. Dun, 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 dun. We all know it. And did you know that the composer of Joy to the World, it's not even his most famous poem set to music. He composed the song that has become even more memorable. His most famous composition has been sung even more times. It can be argued that this song by American composer Lowell Mason might be the most sung song of all time. Many of you actually know how to play this song. Uh, anybody know what song it is? Okay, I'm going to play it for you. Okay, on my magical piano right here. Are you ready? Mary had a little lamb. Lowell Mason, he composed some bangers. Okay, Joy to the World, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Uh, that's what he's most famous for. And could Mary Had a Little Lamb actually, maybe potentially, be about Mary, the mother of God? Has this been hiding in plain sight this whole time? The Mary of Scripture did indeed have a little lamb, and his name was Jesus, who was indeed the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Maybe his fleece wasn't as white as snow, but the Bible says that he washed us white as snow. Who knew this children's lullaby was a Christian spiritual? Not me. Joy to the World is one of my favorite Christmas carols because I think that the song accomplishes its own proclamation. It's almost impossible not to have joy when singing it. Joy is this irrevocable part of the Christmas season, and joy is an irrevocable part of the Christmas story. And the Gospel writer Luke makes sure that we don't lose this, this important fact, that joy is a part of the first Christmas. The first time we find joy in the Christmas story, there was an older couple named Elizabeth and Zechariah. They struggled with infertility. In a culture where children were your status, 
where children were your lifeline. They tried their whole marriage to have a child. They prayed their entire lives for a child. And when they were too old to conceive, an angel tells Zechariah that he's going to be a dad. He's going to have a son and his name will be John, which means God is gracious. And in Luke 1.14, the angel says this of John, he will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. So Elizabeth and Zechariah, they're overjoyed at the news. And Elizabeth was six months pregnant and another angel enters the story. This time to Elizabeth's cousin, a young woman named Mary. And when telling Mary about how she is going to miraculously give birth to the savior of the world, the angel also mentions that her cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Verse 39, at that, that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Isn't that beautiful? This baby John that was to become John the Baptist leaps for joy when only hearing the sound of Mary's voice. See, there is joy even in utero in the Christmas story. And when Elizabeth gives birth, we read this in Luke 1. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. Everyone shared her joy. She held in her arms the very thing that she had been praying for her entire life. And all of her neighbors and relatives shared her joy. Joy is mentioned four times in Luke's Christmas narrative. The last is on the very first Christmas when Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, gives birth to a son whom she names Jesus because he will save the world from their sins. Luke chapter two. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Great joy for all people. You know what that sounds like? Sounds like joy to the world. Christians should be people of joy and that joy should spread to all people. Do you bring joy? Do you lift others up? Luke speaks of joy four times in his Christmas story. Matthew speaks of it only once, but it's a big one. And it is in the story of the Magi that we looked at last week. Matthew 2, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Remember, the Magi had been waiting 600 years for this king to arrive, and when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Okay, this, this word overjoyed here, it's a unique Greek word because it's actually a combination of four Greek words. The third word in this is megas. It's where we get the word mega, get big, huge, great. The most literal translation of this sentence would be something like, after seeing the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with mega joy. That's the kind of joy I want. I want to rejoice exceedingly with mega joy. This carol, joy to the world. It taps into something 
we all long for. We're all looking for joy. We're looking for happiness. And so many of us aren't finding it. Where is it? How do we get it? Everybody seems to have a different answer. Every talk show, self-help book, or magazine cover has steps. Seven steps to joy, five steps to happiness, three steps to your best life now. If you were to Google search, how to be happy, oh, you would get over 9 billion results in 0.37 seconds. Go to the bar, get drunk, meet other people. That'll make you happy. Every commercial seems to say, buy our product and you'll be happy. I saw a commercial not long ago. It was one for dishwashing liquid. And the opening scene showed a woman standing over a sink, greasy dishes, scrubbing hard against some dried lasagna that wouldn't come off a plate. Her hair's disheveled. The kids are running around the kitchen. Her husband probably watching TV. And the woman standing over the dirty sink looked toward the heavens as though to cry out to God, how can this be happening to me? And then the new dishwashing liquid was introduced. There was a magic graphic about how the dishwashing liquid has little living bubbles that dissolve dirt and grime on contact. And after the magic bubbles were explained, we were back at the woman's kitchen. The woman's hair was done. She was down 20 pounds. The kids were doing their homework. The husband was back in the picture, holding his arms around her like it was a junior high couple at lunch. Is this commercial really about dishwashing liquid? When you break it down, looking at the subtext, the commercial seems to be saying something like, use this dishwashing liquid, your problems will go away, your kids will behave, and your spouse will be more into you, okay? It's not true, okay? I've got three cases of that stuff in my pantry at home, okay? They're not selling soap, they're selling happiness, they're selling joy, and I want my money back. People think that if you could just get the right person or the right thing, then you'll be happy. But true, lasting joy and happiness isn't something you find in the world. C.S. Lewis said, joy is an unsatisfied desire, which itself is more desirable than any satisfaction. Joy never comes by seeking joy. Pleasure works that way. You can get pleasure by going out tonight and pursuing pleasure and doing whatever. Joy doesn't arrive that way. Joy only comes through seeking something other than itself. Paul's letter to the Philippians is a master class in joy. 18 times in this short four chapter book, Paul talks about rejoicing or joy. I wanna encourage you this week to read all four chapters at some point. It might take you 20 minutes, but in the beginning of his letter, he says this, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. In my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. That's amazing. But what is even more amazing is that when Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, when he mentions joy 18 times, when he says, I always pray with joy, Paul himself is in prison. This master class on joy is a letter written from a jail cell. Look at what Paul says in verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul says that everything that has happened to him has helped spread the good news. Not just some of the things that happened to him, not just the things that he liked that happened to him. Paul says all things, and that includes the fact that he's in prison. Not just prison, but chained to guards all day long. They would rotate guards, and Paul was connected to them, bound with chains. How painful it must have been all day long. Yet, he confesses, all these things have helped spread the good news of Jesus. Not only has the gospel spread, 
but it's continuing to advance. The Greek word here means to drive forward. It is a beautiful picture of pioneers cutting through uncharted territory to make a way. He's saying that that's what's happening with the gospel. He's in prison. Things look bleak. And yet, there's always a bright side. In the middle of like this weight and this darkness, Paul chooses to look at the bright side. Can we? What about this season in your life can be good? Because there is something in your life in this season that one day you'll miss. But you're taking it for granted right now because of all the other stuff that's going on. Lean into the good. It's there. Or perhaps you can't find any of the good. The bright side is that it won't always be like this. It's a season. The temporary nature of it. That can be the bright side itself. That this season will end. Maybe that's what God is saying to you right now listening to this in Iowa, in Southern California, in Oregon, in Ohio, in Spain. I don't know, but this is a season. That can be the bright side that this season will end? Or could the beauty of God and nature that he created, can that itself be the bright side? Sometimes we have to go outside and literally smell roses, find a flower, find a pine tree, find a dandelion, a rose bush, and literally stop and smell the roses. It's in heaven and nature sing. Fields, floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. All of creation repeat the sounding joy to the world. Tonight, today, this week, could you drive to the countryside, stare up at the big bright sky, and watch the universe declare his praise. And perhaps our problems might just look a little bit smaller. In the last part of his letter to the Philippians, Paul writes, all saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Oh, there are Christians in Caesar's household? How did that happen? Well, Paul talked to the guards the guards talked to others, and before you knew it, there were baptized believers all up in the kingdom. You see, it wasn't Paul who was chained to his guards. It is the guards who were chained to him. And here's the remarkable part. Instead of seeing the soldier next to him as an inconvenience, Paul saw him as a captive audience, the bright side. And Paul's message was compelling because Paul's character was compelling. Paul's character and his demeanor would influence those around him because Paul lived as a free man even when he was in chains. Prison couldn't defeat him. Chains couldn't bind him. Walls couldn't hinder him. His joy wasn't based on outward circumstances. It was something inside. I want that kind of joy. And Jesus offers us this kind of joy, this life abundant, the kind of joy that's not based on what's going on around you, the, the kind of joy that is experienced even chained to a guard in a prison cell. Lost in the hustle and bustle of our lives, we have missed something. We have confused happiness, and joy. They are not the same. Happiness is external, joy internal. Happiness is what's going on around me. Joy is what's going on within me. Happiness is based on chance, but hear this, joy is based on choice. I choose to focus on what God has done for me rather than what the world is doing to me. 
Choices lead, feelings follow. So in this season, there is worry, there is fear, there is anxiety, I get it, but there can also be joy, and you can choose joy. That song, Joy to the World, it's not the Lord has come, but the Lord is come, as in the Lord is coming. And on that day of the Lord's arrival, the earth will receive her king. The song is about the future arrival of Jesus, not just the arrival 2,000 years ago on that first Christmas in Bethlehem. The song is about a dream and hope for the future, not just adoration of the past. There is a family in our church who 17 years ago, their daughter was born. They named her Lucy, which means illuminating light. Lucy was born at 23 weeks and she weighed one pound, three ounces. These new parents went through the most difficult time of their lives, crying, hoping, wishing, praying for their daughter. One of the nurses at the hospital was moved and inspired by the illuminating light of Lucy. She went to the gift shop and bought her a tiny little music box. And when the music box opened up, it played a song. Mary had a little lamb. In that hospital, her parents chose to dream about the beautiful girl their daughter would grow up to be. The stuff that most parents dread, the lack of sleep because of a crying newborn. Lucy's parents hoped and prayed for the day when their baby girl was home and she'd wake them up in the middle of the night because her pacifier fell out. And then mom and dad would sing her back to sleep with the lullaby, Mary had a little lamb. This tiny music box purchased at a hospital gift shop, given to a tiny baby and to two new parents. It pointed toward a future day when they would be home. Even something small like a music box, playing a children's nursery rhyme, can point to something greater, much greater. Lucy is 17 now, and she's greater than all the hopes and dreams that mom and dad had for her back in that hospital all those years ago. Mom and dad made a choice. They chose to hope. They chose to cling to Jesus. And it is in our most difficult days that we may realize that Jesus is all we need when Jesus is all we have. Will you choose joy today? God, we thank you for the joy of Christmas. We thank you that even in our sufferings, you are with us. When we feel like we are bound by prison walls, chained to a guard, you're with us. God, help us to choose joy, to see the bright side, and with the exceeding joy of the birth of our Savior, would that joy permeate every aspect of our lives this week, this season, and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us online at Prodigal Church Fresno. Uh, next week is Christmas Sweater Sunday, and we're going to have a ton of fun. A lot of fun things planned. We encourage you to show up in person if you're in the Central Valley. If not, we can't wait to see you online. Get those sweaters ready, and you can watch it from the couch. God bless you, and peace in the Middle East.